The Cinema 5D Virtual Show is brought to you by B&H, the professional source for all your video needs. CVP, the leading specialist in creative cine, video and photo solutions. Fujifilm, value from innovation. Atomos, better monitoring, better recording. And Hollyland, for a better view. Hi guys, I'm Johnny from Cinema 5D and welcome to our virtual show. And unlike normal exhibitions that we are talking mostly for, to manufacturers about new equipment, in our virtual show, I have the pleasure to host some uh, key members from our uh, filming community. And this is really a good chance to talk about them, to know to get them better and hear about their work. And today I have Ben Sherlock with me. Ben, how are you? Yeah, doing really well, thank you. Very well indeed. Very happy to have you here, and you've been working with the BBC for quite some time. You're freelance, am I right? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I'm freelance, which is it's great. It's great. It gives me a good opportunity to work with lots of people, but I often find myself coming back to the BBC. Nice. But first of all, and this is the most important, I want the people to get to know you a little bit, a little bit better and closer. So first of all, how old are you? Yeah, so I'm 31 years old. Um, I've been in the industry for the past... 10 to 12 years depending on sort of where you started from uh it's been an amazing journey to get to the point that i sort of am now and i love it i mean i feel like the luckiest person in the world sometimes the job i get to do the places i get to go like most of us i guess if you feel like that then you know you're in the right job and you're uh, actually from the uk am i right yeah that's correct yeah from the uh, from the southeast of england but you started, before making all those beautiful documentaries that we're going to talk about uh, very, very soon, you actually started as a wedding uh, filmmaker, if it's okay to say this. Tell me a little bit about how you started from zero to 100. <laughs> Indeed. Um, yes, yeah, so my journey started a long time ago. And when I, when I first left school, I had this sort of arrogance to think that I could go out straight away and just, just smash it and do it all on my own. And I very quickly found out that I couldn't. And I spent about four years just making a series of terrible, terrible mistakes um, for a variety of clients. But I sort of kept going. And I kept going while making wedding films. I had the idea that, you know, my best way into adventure filmmaking, into travel filmmaking and big sort of documentaries was to do it by making wedding films. <laughs> because it was all I had access to. It was the only way I could sort of see myself finding my way into this industry. I had no contacts. I, you know, I didn't know anybody in this world. It just looked like a really cool job. You know, it, mar it sort of married together the really creative sides of my brain with the side that was sort of desperate for adventure and travel. So yeah, wedding filmmaking, that's what I started off doing. And alongside that, I think it's sort of critical to remember is that I wasn't just making wedding films, I was training. I was using it as a, as a way of testing my skills every single time, doing things faster, doing things better. And that's, that's what I did. And alongside that, I was also uh, doing sort of independent documentaries. So I was sort of regularly going out anytime I could to go and shoot interesting stories. One of which was the story of a conflict artist called Xavier Pick. A friend of mine called Anthony and myself hatched a plan to take him out to a conflict zone. And against all the odds, and after about three years of trying to get this artist to go out to a conflict zone, we found ourselves embedded with the US military and heading out into an active war zone, Iraq in 2011. Wow, that sounds amazing. But before going into the war zone, let's talk about a different war, which is filling weddings. Just like, a, a, yeah, because this is actually not so easy uh, when I think about it all in general. Uh, usually you have one chance to film the I do stuff. And there's a lot of pressure. And somehow I feel that our colleagues in the wedding industry are not always being respected or not always getting the respect that they should get. Wow. Yeah. Filming weddings is not an easy job. When I sort of look back on that time, it was probably, probably one of the most stressful jobs that I've ever had. You know, these people have such high expectations of what they expect to be delivered. There are no second takes, even on products that I work on these days, I get more of a chance to get it right than I did back then. So you had to be perfect every single time. 
And word travels really, really, really fast in the wedding industry. If you make one mistake, if you miss one line, if you don't capture some footage of you know, a relative that's, that you're supposed to know through telepathy. The auntie eating the chicken or the soup. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, the auntie eating. If you, if you miss that shot of, of the auntie eating soup at a particular moment, then you, know, you get ripped for it. So you have to be everything. You, you can't, you're not just a, a filmmaker, you're also gonna be their best friend. You're also probably gonna be editing the piece. You haven't just sort of set expectations in the first instance and walk them through the whole process. Yeah, it's a, it's a complete minefield of a job. So I have massive admiration for people who, who work in the wedding filmmaking industry. Yeah, I, I have to say that in the old days, I used to offer friends to film their wedding as a present. And I think I did it once or twice, and then I, that's it. Not only the yeah. pressure, it's either you are in the wedding as a guest or you're working. You cannot really combine the two. And uh, more than that, as you said, it, afterwards it's the editing and everything. So you end up with something which is really very big. And if you are a working professional, you simply don't have the time to do this all and you don't want to disappoint your friends. So I did it once or twice and that was more than enough. Um, let's move to the war zone, to the, because you said you ended up in Iraq, which is quite amazing. Yeah. And as you said, it took some, some time to convince the troops or whoever is in charge on the troops to have you there. Just to summarize before we go to the main topic of this conversation, how did it feel to be in a war zone for you? You've been young and knowing young people, you think that nothing can happen to you and you can just do it. But in reality, how was it? When we got the green light to go to Iraq in 2011, the furthest place a field that I'd ever filmed was, I think, France. Uh, I'd never really traveled and I had just been filming weddings. So yeah, it was a completely different world that I stepped into and I had absolutely no awareness of what it was gonna be like. I was totally unprepared for it, but I loved it. Yeah, the second that we stepped onto the Hercules C-130, the big sort of military aircraft, I could just sort of feel myself coming alive. It sort of felt like this was where I'd always wanted to be the whole time, strapped into uh, a military aircraft with soldiers all around me and camera gear all over me heading off to go and film something really exciting and all that being said i don't think i had any real awareness of what it took to do it all the sort of skills and tricks that i've picked up along the way and that i know now I, I didn't know them at the time so i really i was completely unprepared and in reality you know at 21 years old i think i was or 20 i had absolutely no business being in that sort of situation we we blagged our way into it and we were very lucky that actually the people that we were traveling with were very prepared, were sort of professionals in their field. So, you know, they really sort of took us under their wing. They really sort of took us under their wings and kept us safe in that situation. But we relied very, very heavily on them, which is not something that I'd be doing now. Again, taking the experience that I have now working in those sorts of situations, I would do things very, very differently. I would have more responsibility for my safety myself, as opposed to sort of handing it off to, to other people, which is what we did in that situation, which is the wrong thing to do. In an early conversation that we had, you said that after this job was completed, actually it, it uh, opened the door for you for what you do now as a documentary filmmaker. So just, just to describe the step that you made from Iraq to what you do today uh, at the BBC. Take it, take it back a little bit further, actually. So when we were actually, I think a week, it was about a week before we were leaving Iraq and we were all sitting down together and having sort of like a sort of a meal and talking about what we'd been through, what we'd seen. And the artist Xavier sort of said, your lives are never going to be the same. You're never going to sort of, your careers are going to go to a completely different place. And it was the day after that we landed in the UK that I was back for my weddings again. <laughs> Everything basically returned straight to normal as soon as I got back home, which was quite demoralizing because I found exactly what I wanted to do. But actually about two weeks after that, I was on an airplane again, heading out to El Salvador. And the doors had just all opened. After I did that shoot, a production company who had basically loaned us some kits because we were friends with them asked saw the rushes from the footage and said look we love what you shot out in iraq would you like to come with us out to el salvador to film for this charity and from there it just snowballed and i was able to leverage so much of what i'd done in the conflict zone to find access to interesting stories fast forward to what you do today you are a documentary filmmaker uh, as a freelance you work for the bbc and 
you try to do really or you know, to work in top documentary series like what 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 uh, what are you doing exactly and what uh, series you're working on for a long time i was doing sort of documentary filmmaking but it was on a quite a small scale so i was making sort of mini documentaries doing a lot of work at charities a lot of the, a lot of sort of new stuff but my aspirations were always to you know make sort of big sort of cinematic documentaries that's what i really wanted to do was to make things that were cinematically outstanding and that was basically what i just focused on completely for years and years and years until eventually i met the right people basically and i had the body of work to back up my talk you know i had been to lots of difficult places i filmed lots of very very tough subjects so then when I was trying to get my foot in the door with people like the BBC to film sort of larger sort of documentary series, I had all of the sort of background in it that would be attractive to them, particularly working in extreme environments. You know, some of the most amazing stories that I'd ever come across were stories that were found in really, really tough places. And there were places that a lot of people either couldn't get to or didn't want to go to. So because I had that background in working in tough places, it meant that people like the BBC looked at me and thought, well, here's a guy who can shoot beautifully, but he can also go to really, really tough places to do it. And that changed everything for me. And that opened the door to a particular series called Sacred Wonders, which is a BBC One documentary. Sorry, it was a BBC One documentary series, basically looking at the world's greatest sacred wonders and the people that inhabit them which was just the absolute sort of pinnacle of everything that I'd always wanted to shoot. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you could have made a, a perfect series for me, it would have been Sacred Wonders. You had these human stories, which were really, really engaging you know, about people doing, you know, ridiculous things, everything from, you know, training as a Kung Fu monk in the Shaolin Temple to coating a ancient mosque in mud in five hours. Um, you know, there was the, all these just crazy rituals around the world in really tough to get to, really remote places. It was just a dream come true. So yeah, that series for me was a real, a real sort of coming home kind of moment. It felt like a moment when I really found exactly the sort of stories that I wanted to be making for the rest of my career. Very nice. And I would like to talk about uh, one specific piece uh, uh, that actually that's why we are conducting the interview. And this is your piece about the Shaolin monk, a person who actually just entering his final test. And if he will pass the test, he will become a monk. And like any other story, as far as I'm concerned, it has two uh, vital legs, like really two standpoints that everybody, when you look at this, it's like, will he make it or not? In really, in a nutshell, a little bit about this story, where you, where you were the one to initiate it, or the production, the BBC production team found the story and then took you to China to shoot this piece. Yeah, so there's a massive production team that surrounds these stories back in the office, in this case, in an office in Glasgow, uh, BBC Studios. BBC Studios basically research and find the most ridiculously good stories I'm often sort of just amazed at how they sort of pull these things out of the hat. There have been, there've been occasions before when a story had fallen through, um, you know, several hours before, and then within a few hours they'd found another remarkable story. And the Kung Fu Monks is a really good example of that. You know, a lot of people have been to the Shaolin Temple to film. It's a place that has been fairly well documented, but it's never really been filmed in such a personal manner as this before, which is what we wanted to do. Um, so yeah, so the research that goes into it from the team at BBC Studios is phenomenal. And then they approached me, because I've been working on the whole series, uh, to go out there and film it. And again, when you get that sort of phone call where they say, do you want to go to China? You know, obviously, usually you say yes, but then when they say, do you want to go to China to film in the Shaolin Temple? You're like, oh, that sounds incredible. But then when they say, do you want to go to China to film at the Shaolin Temple, to film a Kung Fu monk in training, I mean, your mind just blows with how cool that could possibly be. And it was everything that I had imagined it would be. I feel like myself and the director, uh, Ben Crichton, said to us, said to each other that we really felt like it was a real gift of a story because it had everything. Like he said, it's got the sort of, it's got that sort of underdog feel to it. Um, it's got genuine jeopardy because this was a monk who was genuinely going through these tests 
and he was genuinely scared that he wouldn't pass them, particularly the, um, the written one. He had to memorise an absurd amount of content to speak out. And his physical skills were great. Actually, his ability with a stick to do what was called you know, monkey going up the stick was pretty good. Uh, he was pretty well regarded in his community. So there wasn't a massive worry about him succeeding at that. But as far as his studying goes, he wasn't very strong. So there was genuine jeopardy there. So you're actually falling into a situation which is a real situation. And let's try to break it into a few categories. First of all, it's the most important, but on the other hand, the less significant thing in this equipment. What I mean is, of course, it's extremely important what you take with you to those type of assignments. But on the other hand, if you are professional and you have the eye, you can literally shoot good stuff with a mobile phone. I'm just exaggerating a little bit, but you, I think you know what I mean. It's really about your talent. So tell me what you decided to take with you uh, to our journey like this, because I guess it's a matter of main camera, backup, and so on. But again, very compact. Yeah, so the kit that you take into these sorts of situations, I suppose I always want to try and marry together, taking the right gear that's going to give me something very cinematic, but also not going overboard and taking you know hundreds of bags that are just going to weigh me down. So often I think it's it's less about having an extra bag full of lenses, but actually just having the right lens on you at the right moment. So that means actually, you know, what are the three lenses that I can't live without and have them on you at all times? So for me, that was having a decent set of Cine Primes, which were Sigma Cine Primes, a 35, a 50 and an 85 millimeter. Those are lenses that I can shoot on all day and pretty much the entire, this entire sequence at least was filmed between those three different lenses with the odd exception here and there. But the vast majority of it was shot on those lenses. Then you've got the Canon C300 Mark II. Again, that's a great camera because it's, it's, it's all right there. You don't need you know, external recorders. You don't need extra battery packs. Um, there's, there's nothing that you sort of bolting onto it. It kind of is, it's already done. So that's, that's ideal for me because it means I can just pull out of the bag and I'm, and I'm ready to go. You've got two, two card slots in there. So that's, that's obviously very useful as well. Um, then gimbal. I mean, I don't really go anywhere without a gimbal. And the one I like to use is the Ronin M. You know, I've tried a lot of the single handed ones, but for me, I just find that I get a bit of a smoother motion using the sort of double handed Ronin M. And again, it's underslung as well, which again, for me personally, and this, I think this is it, it's all just about what works best for you. But I always find that I get the most stable shots when the camera is sitting below as opposed to sitting above. And also, I never know what sort of conditions are going to run into. You know, it could be really windy, and in those sorts of situations, gimbals that go upwards, I don't find they function as well. So, you know, it, I just like to make sure that I'm giving myself the best possible chance of getting the best possible shots. And on that gimbal, I had the Canon EOS R with an a, uh, Atomos Ninja 5 recorder. And that's pretty much it. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the bulk of the kit that I'm running with. I have time-lapse kits as well, which I crack out occasionally, but more often than not, they'll end up sitting in the car and getting used once or twice. Two quick questions, because there are some drone shots in this uh, piece that we are um, presenting. What drone did you use? Yeah, so we had a local drone crew and they shot on the DJI Inspire 2. They were fantastic, needed very little direction. Again, I always really think that my role as a DOP is so often just sort of to get out of the way of the professionals. The, the great thing about this show, and actually most of the productions that I've worked on with the BBC, is that the teams that are pulled together are all absolute professionals. And the last thing they need is me hovering around, you know, telling them how to compose a shot because these guys are the best at what they do. So all they need is a brief from me and then they can go off and do their thing, which is exactly what they did. And my second question, because you said that uh, you are actually using Sigma prime lenses, and of course the, those are very, very nice. But when you're in a documentary situation, wouldn't you prefer to work with a zoom lens or even, and I'm sorry to mention, autofocus? And of course I'm laughing a little bit because in the old days autofocus was a complete no-go for um, professionals. But autofocus uh, in many cameras, including of course Canon, with the uh, dual pixel uh, shift uh, working very, very well. Wouldn't you use those type of lenses or autofocus at all in your documentaries? 
there's absolutely like a time and a place for using zoom lenses and there you know there were many instances in this sequence when i was using a zoom lens like a canon 100 to 400 that happens you know every now and again but the vast majority of the time i was sticking on primes and what i do instead of having instead of using very zooms what i'd actually do is have multiple camera positions so i'd have our assistant producer faye who was a fantastic camera operator as well i'd have her on a second angle and then i'd set up a static angle as well again on a on a prime so as opposed to having one position with a zoom on it going backwards and forwards i'd fix that position in the shot that i knew that i wanted and then i would set up a second position with another shot that i knew that i wanted as opposed to just sort of shooting a huge amount of content with the zoom sort of, you know, jumping in and out. I would just set up the shots exactly how I wanted them, hit record and, you know, change position pretty rare, sort of pretty rarely. You know, the gimbal was a place that I was able to use, have a bit more variety because I could obviously move around the subject. But again, that gimbal was always using a prime lens, predominantly a 35 millimeter prime lens. I, and I know it's, it's kind of strange and it's, it seems like a bit of a risk because you're sort of worried that you're going to miss the moment and particularly in situations like this when you're dealing with you know a, a kung fu monk who's doing his action very very quickly and also he doesn't have the physical strength to do it more than once or twice you know even when he was just practicing if we were to ask him to repeat some of these moves again he would just say no because they were so strenuous it just wasn't physically possible so i suppose i looked at you know, what we were doing in the same way as he was looking at what he was doing. And I was thinking, we have one chance to get these shots perfect. You know, there was no missing focus. So actually I chose to shoot entirely on manual focus. And for this series, the whole series, we pretty much shot everything on manual focus. It's not that the technology isn't good because I'm totally aware of, you know, where Canon's autofocus is now. It is fantastic. But I wanted to use Sigma Cine Primes and those lenses have the ability to autofocus and actually i just prefer the organic nature of going with it and when you can really get into a flow with a subject um, like yandy and the kung fu monk i found myself really being able to start predicting where he was going to move you know it took a few days and we were sort of practicing with him for a long time you know to make sure i was learning where he was going to go at certain times but once you've got that flow you know you can start manually focusing with them and i found i was hitting my marks you know nearly every time it's a challenge, but, you know, practice makes perfect. Sounds very nice. Although, again, you said that you're working with how many, uh, two or three cameras uh, simultaneously, am I right? Yeah, so not all the time, you know, but on the occasions when we absolutely couldn't miss the moment, we'd often have three cameras running at once. Okay, no, that that's of course, explains the, the dynamic here, yeah, because, of course, it's all about not missing the point, especially when you're in a situation over there when the monk was tested and he was uh, standing in front of his uh, of the people who were actually testing him, and I think it's important to say that the next test, instead in, in case he's uh, not not passing this one, is in a three years time, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. And over there, you with how many with how many cameras did you work in the room itself when he's standing in front of the? Because actually there are two two different parts. One when he's doing the monkey up the stick, up the, up the tree, sorry, with the stick. And the other one when he's trying to um, remember a few phrases from those 2000 pages, yeah. So how many cameras did you use in those occasions? Yeah, so in the testing situations, we had four cameras running. So we had uh, two C300 Mark IIs and they were both on sticks. One was shooting sort of through the doorway and one was tucked behind a pillar so they couldn't be seen by each other. And then we had the gimbal, which is obviously with the EOS R. And then we had a GH5, which was like a backup camera that I hadn't planned on using, but we ended up strapping that again, sort of high above to give us another angle. So yeah, lots of options to cover that situation. We got two goes at it. We got the sort of the, the one occasion when he did it for a sort of reel, and that was the one he was tested on. And then we actually had the opportunity to shoot it a second time, just for a few extra sort of tight shots, which was a real, it yeah, was a real sort of blessing for us in that situation because there were definitely a few little extra moments that we wanted to crunch in on, which even though we had four angles on it, I felt like we just needed a little bit extra. So we were able to convince them to just give us one more go to, to get those extra shots. That's very nice. That's where the, the name BBC come, comes handy. <laughs> because usually <laughs> in some situations, that's what you have. That's it. But 
No, very nice. Very good to know that you had the, the, the chance to repeat some stuff if you needed it or not repeat, but do a backup. I mean, that was so that was that, that was for the actual physical test when he was doing the monkey up the stick. But on the uh, when he was uh, recounting his his passage, that was in one take only. They didn't allow us to do it more than once because they had a lot of people to get through the door. So that was a, a single take. But that was a bit easier because we knew. You know, we knew exactly where he was going to stand, so that was really helpful. We were in there for about 45 minutes before he entered the room, so we were able to adjust our positions to get it exactly right for when he walked in. We knew how roughly how high he was, how, how tall he was, so again, we'd set our cameras based on that height before we'd even entered the room. I think you really, with, 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 with situations like that, you've got to know that sort, those sorts of things, particularly if you're working with prime lenses. Absolutely, and when it comes to light and then sound how did you deal with light mostly available light or well we, we use no artificial light whatsoever apart from some candles we use candles in the sequence where he's uh, chanting in the monastery where they chant in the mornings there is basically no light at all apart from a few electric candles those just weren't really feeling right to us. They were flickering as well, which wasn't ideal. So we asked if we would be able to replace the electric candles with real candles, which they were more than happy to do. But apart from that, yeah, no, no artificial light was put in whatsoever. It was all just what you saw. And when it comes to sound recording, I, I guess you had a soundman with you. And did he use any special method or it was mostly boom? Yeah, so we had the, the fearless and veteran sound recorder, Simon Forrester. He's a bit of a legend when it comes to the BBC. And he, he was always able to predict exactly how long his boom should be for certain situations. He would actually know how wide my frame was just by which lens I had on and roughly where I was tilted. So I don't think he, we don't think we got the boom in shot once with him. He was exceptionally good. Uh, Despite having a boom, he also would wire up Yandy and the main monk. And also if there was a secondary sort of principal actor in that moment, then he would also put a microphone on them as well. And that would pretty much run for the whole day. He wouldn't sort of change it at all. And then, yeah, he would just have the boom incredibly long for the rest of the time. I think actually also during the morning when the chanting was going on, he went in a little bit earlier and planted a few mics at strategic locations where he knew he'd get the best sound. And again, actually, now I think about it, he was also... During, for instance, the yeah, during the various tests, he was hiding mics in a few different locations around the room. He's he's very good, very quick. Never had to worry about it. I think when you work with those sorts of sound recordists, they make your life so much easier because then all you have to do is focus on the focus on the visuals. There's no no distraction when it comes to sound because it's such a massive part of storytelling. So to have that sort of weight lifted off you and an expert deal with it so beautifully. It just gives you complete creative freedom to focus on the job at hand. Just more uh, anecdote or actually point when it comes to sound. What about the sound design of the actual piece? Yeah, so the, the sound design is all done in post-production. Again, Simon was gathering like a lot of ambient sound throughout the whole shoot, which would then get used you know, to build the sort of sound bed that sits beneath it. But that's all taken, yeah, taken care of by the post-production company. Uh, back to the shooting or to the shooting scenario, did you shoot everything in log or already in some uh, preset picture profile? So we shot the whole thing uh, with a Rec 709 filter on it. So we shoot it in Canon C Log 3, but with a Rec 709 on top of that. So you still get a fair amount of dynamic range, but actually there's a fair amount of color that's already burnt into the image to begin with. That's not the, you know, that, that's not something we did for every single one of these shoots but it's one that I like to do whenever I have the opportunity to. The reason for that is because I want to get every aspect of this right on the shoot. I don't want to leave things to be fixed in post-production. I want it to look how I want it to look right there and then. So what you describe is actually in post-production, there is no color correction at all, or there's just a little bit of adjustments? Oh, they're still, yeah, I mean, they still have to sort of match the cameras together a little bit, and there's still a fair amount of grading that's involved in it. But when I look back at the original rushes against what I've shot on location, they're not hugely different. There's just, you know, maybe a little bit of noise reduction here, or maybe a little bit of pushing the blacks and everything else here. I mean, the editors will probably kill me when they hear me talking about it so disparagingly. I'm sure, that, I'm sure it was a mess. They had to massively fix all my mistakes. But I do try to make it to get it as close to the final product on the shoot as I possibly can do. 
the video now of course lives in YouTube like that's that's always the case now I think with modern uh, filming I think it has more than 14 million views yeah the comments do you sometimes read the comments or a, <laughs> how do you feel yeah this was the first uh, film that I've ever then had a film someone make a film about that film uh, there was a youtuber who basically did a piece about it and I've never ever had that before so that was really amazing and a lot of people you know were quite sort of panicked about that but I took it as a massive compliment because you know people were trying to sort of say that it wasn't real that this was all completely set up and all these sorts of things which just wasn't true because you know I was I was there so that was really interesting uh, to sort of get that sort of level of sort of critique on the piece uh, some of the comments were amazing though, you know, I think on the whole they were, they were really positive. I think when you've got a video that gets 14 million views, you're, you're going to get a mixed bag. But I hope that the majority of them were, were sort of positive. For me, just, just the fact that, you know, even on the BBC or if it's on Netflix or on National Geographic, the viewing figures are never that high. So to know that your work has been seen by 14 million people is kind of, it's still kind of a bit, <laughs> it's a bit mind blowing. Just, I think it's important to say that the film was shot during 2019, am I right? What was the season, more or less? That's right, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, it was, it was, it was shot at the beginning of 2019. It was, I think, one of the last ones for the whole series, and it was broadcast in August 2019. Ben, thank you very much. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. It was very interesting uh, to hear what you have to say. Me, myself, I'm a documentary filmmaker. Uh, I have some, or quite a lot of experience working with the BBC too. Um, but it's always nice to talk to colleagues and hear how they treat different situation, uh, situations and how they move around and do stuff. And that's the best school, I guess, to watch others, to see what you shot, uh, to be inspired. And I really hope that our, uh, after our conversation, many people will be inspired and just go out and do some stuff. Ben, thank you very much for joining us. And guys, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you.